Bueno, pues eh, por último vamos a oír al doctor Briganti, que, que es un placer tenerle aquí porque ha costado varios años, pero por fin está. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you so much for this kind invitation, Dr. Astovita, and of course the scientific committee. It has been quite a short trip from Milan to Bilbao, but uh, we have a direct flight today, not tomorrow. So actually, I, I'm, I have been given the task of uh, summarize what we have uh, delivered in terms of publication, in terms of uh, European Neurology Association position on active surveillance. This is just a summary of what you have heard already uh, over the last presentation. So what to do in many active surveillance? So the field is evolving, okay? And we now have imaging, we now have biomarkers, but honestly, many of these is based on pure clinical assessment. And uh, once you do right and correct uh, good clinical assessment, which I believe still is mainstay of therapy in, patient, in patients uh, suitable for active surveillance. So here is the recent database results saying that we actually mainly manage low-risk disease with active surveillance, which is correct, especially in the US, but also in Europe. So last year, we decided to actually group together a series of people trying to give recommendations on what to do with active surveillance. This is a position paper. This is not like a guideline paper, nor based on systematic reviews. This was done based on literature review and based on extra opinion, which is, in a, in a way, very weak. But still, we wanted to give some position statements on what to do on active surveillance to practicing urologists. So we actually came up with, a, this is a very busy slide, I'm sorry, I'm, gone, I'm not going through this, but we came up with a series of recommendations based on uncertainties. So those like gray areas in active surveillance in which we can drive decision making for, again, urologists seeing patients every day. So basically, the whole story of active surveillance started to include very low risk disease. So you pick up those with gleason 3 plus 3, minus 3 plus 3 in a way, very small cancer, one or two positive cores, percentage of involvement very low. So we actually started active surveillance enrolling only those with very low risk disease. Is this correct? Yes, maybe. But now we are moving towards enrolling all patients with low risk prostate cancer. Why? Basically because the main data coming from long-term analysis of active surveillance are coming from Lawrence Krotz group. And actually, at that time, when he started active surveillance, there was no MRI, there was no biomarkers. There was PSA, clinical stage done by digital rectal examination. So old-style urology. Despite old-style urology, overall survival is great, and treatment effect survival is very good. So at 10 years, pretty much 60% of the patients they still had prostate in situ, so untreated, which is, I mean, un un unbelievable. And there was no absolutely my MRI, there was no absolute biomarker. And I completely agree with Dr. Yorente that it's not possible to do better than this. You can put MRI, you spend a lot of money, yes, but can you beat these results? I think unlikely. So, and then we have like the PROTECT trial, okay? That is the best trial ever available, which randomized patients to active monitoring, radical prostatectomy versus radiation therapy, one of, the, one of the most expensive trials ever done in the history of medicine. So actually, you see one thing, that if you go for active monitoring, which is not even active surveillance, you just actually select patients and you follow patients with PSA over time. Nothing fancy, no MRI, no biomarkers, nothing very expensive, only PSA, and do, you, then when your PSA is increasing over a certain threshold, you do biopsy, old style. And if you go for that, pretty much this guy will never, will never actually die from prostate cancer. And the prostate trial is mainly low risk, low to intermittent, to be honest. Okay, the active monitor group has higher rates of intervention, but still, radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy, the same cancer receiving mortality rate as compared, to, as, as compared to a badly done active surveillance. That means that, well, we may expand active surveillance not only to low very low risk patients, but also to low risk in general. So we may, I mean, reassure our patients that if you, if you have like eight positive cores of gleason 3 plus 3, 
provided that is true reason three plus three, you are maybe you can still enter into active surveillance protocols. Now, if you compare very low risk disease or one or two positive course versus all risk patients and you follow them on active surveillance, there is certainly a higher rate of, of grade reclassification over time. This is perfectly correct. But still, patients should be reassured that if you treat later on, there is no actually losing of any window of therapeutic approach. And you have seen already this slide, just to highlight one thing, that if you treat for, if you go for active, oh, I'm sorry, if you go for active surveillance, actually there is still some patients, 10 year follow up, they actually receive treatment for progression, others they're still on active surveillance, but there are still a certain percentage of patients, approximately 15%, they are actually required active therapy without evidence of progression. I, I believe this is a very bad thing. So we may, we should reassure our patients that doing active surveillance is absolutely safe, feasible, and is the mainstay of therapy for patients with low risk disease. So what about the second statement? I mean, what we do in Milan is whenever we have a patient coming in with a Gleason 3 plus 3 or any biopsy done elsewhere, we ask for internal pathological review. Because in many cases, and these are the results that we have, these are very big slides, I'm sorry, but just focus on these bars those suitable for active surveillance, then we ask them to re review their the biopsy report at our place with our pathologist. Pretty much no one was, I mean, any more candidate for active surveillance because they were all upgraded to three, 3 plus 4 cancer. That means that this was one of the recommendations, not very solid in terms of scientific background, but still we believe that if you have a patient coming from somewhere in the middle of Spain, in the middle of Italy, with a biopsy done in known expert centers, you should require for a pathological revision of the biopsy. Just to be sure that we are not missing something because, I mean, pathology, pathology expertise is very important. What do we MRI? I mean, we already heard about MRI. So actually, clocks data, no MRI at all, excellent outcomes. So do, do we do really need MRI? Well, I mean, I think we need MRI but actually in a properly done way, not in all patients. And again, I'm absolutely against the overuse of imaging for everything. So the statement that we developed for active surveillance candidates using MRI was you have a patient coming in with a biopsy blinded, like very rare now, being honest, but still coming in, should we require no MRI to see if we have missed something up front? Not big data. But as society, we decided to support the fact that you may actually ask your patients anyway to undergo MRI if he, had, he underwent a blind non-MRI guided biopsy. This is because actually we know from some systematic review data that actually if you have MRI, you decrease the rate of reclassification, okay? So you, you, you may use MRI to classify correctly your patients even though evidence supporting this approach is not that big. And more importantly, this was stressed already, we completely agree that if you go for MRI targeted biopsy, always add systematic biopsy, especially in patients with active surveillance. Now, if you don't do systematic biopsy, you miss up to 15% of Gleason 3 plus 4 or higher disease. Is this high rate? Well, might be, especially in patients that may be young, because now we are enrolling more and more younger patients, even on active surveillance. So the main stay of MRI is, you may do after the first biopsy, but the main data supporting the role of MRI in active surveillance is to do MRI prior to confirmatory biopsy. Now, honestly, I don't know what confirmatory biopsy is. I used to call confirmatory biopsy the second biopsy after the initial one. I don't know if it is confirmatory because we usually do one year after initial diagnosis. And if the guy has not received MRI prior to biopsy, if the guy has not received MRI after the first biopsy, we do MRI prior to secondary biopsy, prior to confirmatory biopsy. And this is the strongest data which is supported by the literature. And again, you should always include systematic and targeted biopsy. It's very important, we need to stress that targeted biopsy alone are not sufficient to correctly uh, stage the guy on active surveillance. Now, can we substitute MRI with biopsy over time? Of course, the main issue is decreasing the rates of biopsy over time because you ask your patients to follow biopsy 
not every year, like John Hopkins, they do every year. We do like the prior protocol, one year after the diagnosis, and then every other year. Can we decrease the number of biopsy and use MRI instead? Absolutely not. So we, there is not absolutely no data strong enough to support a, a game shift from biopsy to MRI. So if you follow the patients on active surveillance co properly and correctly, we need to do biopsy as a mainstay of follow-up. We can do MRI like a complementary study to do correct biopsies, as we discussed already, but we cannot substitute biopsy with multiparametric MRI. And in all series, there is biopsy involved. So if you do MRI instead of biopsy, well, you need to have a protocol uh, approved by your ethical committee, otherwise you are in trouble. So this is a statement that we clearly signed, all of us, MRI cannot uh, substitute biopsy over time. And of course, if you have a low risk disease patients, which has low risk disease, despite the presence of positive MRI, it should continue active surveillance. So it's not infrequent to have a patient who is on active surveillance, at some point in time you receive multiparametric MRI, Pirates 5. Wow. So you do biopsy and he's still 3 plus 3. This guy should, this guy remain on active surveillance? Yes or no? Yes. Biopsy is more important than MRI. Why? Because MRI, and we have not discussed yet properly, I believe, has a lot of false positive findings. Especially in patients with low, in centers with low volume. And false positive findings is up to 35%. So actually it's not low. And it has been shown that the more experienced the center is, the lower rates of false positive findings are reported. So what about doing active surveillance? I mean, to push ourselves a little bit further. All, all low risk, okay. What about intermediate risk, close three plus four cancer? Well, again, our statement is that Patients with minimal cancer volume, 3 plus 4, they might be candidate for active surveillance. Some of them, yes. And the guidelines recommend in the presence of Gleason 4 less than 10%. But you need to counsel your patients that these patients has absolutely higher risk of being defined as progressive patients over time. So you may select and pick up some 3 plus 4 for active surveillance. Yes, I believe we can. If the primary glis is sorry, if the Gleason 4 pattern is less than 10%, but you need to tell your patients, listen, the likelihood of receiving active therapy is much higher as compared to patients in the true low risk group. So what about younger patients? We see more and more younger patients. Should we candidate young patients with a long life expectancy to active surveillance? A guy coming in with three or four cores of Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer, low risk, low PSA, C1, uh, C, uh, T1C disease. Should he receive active surveillance despite being very young, yes or no? The answer is yes. So patients or younger patients should anyway be counseled for active surveillance despite the very long life expectancy. So there is no age limit uh, to uh, preclude active surveillance. But you need to tell your patients, listen, the data we have is up to 15 years follow up. The CLOTS data are the best we have available and reliable information are up to 10 to 15 years. Now, I don't know what will happen after 15 years because your life expectancy is likely to be way longer than that. But the patients, young, should and might, could be included anyway in active surveillance. And this has been shown in several series that younger patients, they don't have worse outcome than elderly patients. Now, there is even data saying that elderly patients or so older patients have higher rates of reclassifications as compared to younger ones. So young guys are less likely to be reclassified or to progress. Now, there is a bias here because I believe that elderly patients are way more prone to have like lead time bias. So they, they actually had upfront higher grade disease, which was not detected properly in the beginning. But still, again, this is the data supporting more and more the fact that younger patients should anyway or can anyway 
be considered for active surveillance. So which would be the life expectancy of these patients? So as for radical prostatectomy, as for radiation therapy, as for active treatment in general, these patients should have at least 10 years life expectancy. But maybe 10 years is not enough. So we think that maybe at least 15 years life expectancy. The indolent course is the disease is so huge that you really need to have like very long follow-up. And we believe that it's not a matter of age, it's a matter of life expectancy. So actually the threshold is 10 years, but it's possible that uh, the threshold should be 15 years to decide whether this patient is suitable for active surveillance. And honestly, what we can do, and it's very likely at least to see some elderly patients with Gleason 3 plus 3, should these patients receive active surveillance or simply watchful waiting? So don't come back any longer. I don't want to see you anymore because you are 75, you have low risk prostate cancer detected, I don't know why. Should you follow active surveillance or watchful waiting? You should do this, and this is what actually the guidelines recommend, to screen the patients with the G8, which is a geriatric assessment. Eight very simple questions. You can print the question on your desk. You put on your desk and you ask your patients to fill it out. And if the patient has a score which is higher than 14, despite being elderly, like over 70, you should treat that patient as he was 45. So he might receive active surveillance with standardized protocols and not watchful waiting, which is forget about your cancer, I don't want to see you anymore. Biomarkers, these have been already a bit covered. So is there any biomarker that can be prescribed to better tailor active surveillance programs or decide who the seed treatment up front, who reserves treatment up front? The answer is very clear. There is no marker which can be actually suggested as the real game changer in active surveillance. None of them has been prospectively validated in the active surveillance setting. So actually none of them can be routinely recommended for active surveillance. I personally don't use biomarkers in active surveillance. There are a lot of them, but none of them ever tested prospectively in active surveillance program. PCA3 was with actually kind of very um, uh, yeah, bad results. There is some data now, we are in the era of testing mutations, and there is data from John Hopkins, and I believe this is the strongest data we have so far. This germline mutation of BRCA2 and ATM. And actually, recently, the group of investigators tested the role of BRCA2 mutation and ATM, so DNA gene repair, repair defect in these patients. And it's a very unfrequent mutation because it is less than 5% in these patients, so very rare. So maybe it's not worthwhile to test all these patients with, with BRCA2, BRCA1, or ATM. But still, those, those who had BRCA2 mutations and ATM mutation, they did have higher rates of progression on active surveillance. So maybe if there is a room for something, I believe in the future, we might test these patients for germline mutations to see those who might deserve treatment upfront and not going through biopsies, MRIs, or any kind of expensive stuff. And this is my last slide. Again, I go back to the recommendations. I mean, it was a European Urology publications. And again, uh, what I would like to stress, the last thing is that we should not base on the decision to treat just on patient distress. If the patient is stressed, he might, be, he might see a psycho-oncologist rather than go for radical prostatectomy because at the end we may harm some of these patients with a surgery which can be absolutely and safely avoided. So this is my last slide. I actually have the honor to actually um, chair the team of European Urology Oncology 